So to start off, um, I have a link that I put in the Discord in workshops that has a link to most of this presentation and um, the assets that you would need for this workshop. So you want to download those. Um, I'm going to make a more complete PowerPoint at the end of this to distribute, but in case you get lost, you can look at the PowerPoint and that has almost all of the steps. Um, the goal with the PowerPoint is personally, I hate watching videos, like video tutorials. So I like having a written out thing. So that's literally going to be a step-by-step -step guide too. But yeah, um, I'm doing intro to Unity and I guess we're going to start. So first thing I'm going to do is get out of this presentation. <laughs> And well, as I said, just assets are going to be in that drive. But first, let's go to trying to open up Unity. Um, so the first thing you need to do to access Unity is to go to the Unity Hub, which is where I am right now. I'm going to ignore that. And now it's going to tell me you don't have a license. So let's do manage license. Oh, OK. So to, and then log in. So you guys are probably going to have something like create an account. So look for something that says like create Unity ID. I think you can use this, right, for SSO. OK, so you're going to, has anyone having a hard time finding the spot where it tells you how to create an account? Has everyone found the spot to create an account? OK, so basically use your WPI email so you can get like the student package. So I'm going to put in mine. And then I'm just going to enter my password. And for me, I'm just logging in because I already have them. For you guys, you're going to have to create a password and just follow all those instructions. If there's any questions, just let me know. No, it's not this. Sorry, I haven't had to like set up Unity in a minute. Okay. Would it just be manual activation at this point? Because would it be which one? First one. Because then it says. Okay, I see. Okay, has everyone gotten to this step where you basically are going to do new activation? I'm going to take the silence as a yes. So Unity Personal, I don't use Unity in a personal capacity. And now you have a license. So now you can go to Out of Preferences. And you'll have this image here, Projects. And it's going to say, you have no projects here, unless you already use Unity, in which case you will. So if you do not have a Unity install, which none of the lab peers do right now, because we're in a white period, uh, feel free to follow along on a personal computer or over the shoulder someone else? Um, okay, so first thing you do is open up Unity Hub. So here's a list of all of your projects. Obviously, I have a lot because I've been working in Unity a lot, but I'm going to create a new project for this demo. So I'm going to create a new project, and this is going to be a 2D game. So um, there's two options for 2D. There's 2D Core and 2D UPR. Use UPR if you're planning on adding lighting into your game. This game, we're not going to do lighting. We're not going to get that far. So it's fine to just do 2D core. Here, you can name the project. So I'm just going to call this Unity Demo 1. And then you just press Create Project. And it will start booting up. This will take a minute. In the meantime, I recommend going to Discord and getting to that link in the workshops to get the assets you need and just downloading those to your computer. It's two files. You can technically get away with just doing one, but yeah. Any questions while this loads? Why do you use Unity? 
Uh, I use Unity because it is pretty easy to use, especially for someone who's new to game development. Um, and it is a lot more intuitive for someone who programs. Um, I also like Unity because there's a lot of documentation for Unity. Like the Unity forums are the best place to find help. Um, like really solid. Anytime I can't figure something out, there's usually an answer on the Unity forums. I highly recommend browsing the Unity forums when you have problems. Uh, Stack Overflow can also be helpful, but like the Unity forums are very good. Um, and because Unity is so well documented, it's easy to figure out how to do things. Even if it's something kind of new, you can usually find a tutorial on something adjacent. Another thing to note is when you go to install Unity, there's different versions. There's like the most recent thing, then there's also, well, we'll say LTS, which is long-term support. So it's usually best to just get the most recent long-term support version um, and just go off of there. Um, every now and then they'll release a new one and it'll ask you if you want to update. Updating can be a little bit risky, so you have to think about whether or not it's worth it. Um, usually going up one version isn't much of a big deal, yes. In what way is updating risky? Uh, because there's different changes to like the engine and the code and stuff, so it just breaks things. Um, yeah, especially if you're going from like major versions, like a point one difference isn't gonna have much of an impact. But if you go from like Unity twenty twenty to Unity twenty twenty two or something, you're probably gonna have something really weird just happen. Um, but also uh, as a programmer, I'm in like the mindset of like if it works. Don't, don't touch it, it works. All right, so now I finally have an open scene. I'm gonna quickly go over, also since people are still booting up, um, if I can get this to drop me in the way, uh, what you're looking at right now. So this is the default view for the Unity editor, right? Over here, you have your hierarchy. This is where all of your objects that you place in your scene are going to go. The way Unity works is it's made up of, your game will be made up of scenes. So if you go into the scenes folder, right, I have sample scene, which is the one that is up right now. One thing to note that is if you, you know, make multiple scenes, and also it's a good idea to like rename sample scene, which I can do by right-clicking rename, and just change, is it not going to let me rename it? Oh, I just highlighted it, I just realized, to just like, or not. Okay. Well, here, save scene as. Let's say I want to call this main scene. There we go. Um, I can't spell very well, so you're going to see a lot of typos. Just pretend you didn't see them. Um, unless you can't understand it, and then just ask me. Um, but basically, now I'm in main scene, right? Did it? Yeah, so I just created a new scene by doing that, right? Because I did save as. So now if you notice, the def by default, it'll put main scene in assets. Now, I don't want that because I want it to be in my scenes folder, so I'm just going to drag it over and put it in here. And then I no longer need sample scene, so I will delete it. There's really no difference. It's just like looks better if your main scene isn't called sample scene. Uh, though I'm pretty hypocritical for saying this because my main game, the main scene, is just called sample scene. Um, <laughs> Harry would know. Um, but one thing to note, though, is that if you have multiple scenes, especially when you open up a Unity project, it might not always launch the scene that you're working in. So you might think that you lost everything. You just have to locate the scene and double click it and open it, and then it'll be there. Um, okay, so hierarchy, that's where all your stuff goes, like anytime you add an object. Over here, you have toggles for scene view, animator view, and project settings. We're not going to really get into project settings for this tutorial. Animator, I'll go through later. Then over here is your game view. So this is where the simulation runs. So I recommend staying in game, but if you're doing mobile development, you can go to simulator, and it pretends you're on like some device. Um, another good thing to do is just put yourself in a 16 by 9 aspect. Or else it's going to kind of like weirdly scale. 
And then over here, you have the inspector, which as you add things and you click on them, it gives you all like the information and details. All right. Uh, oh, and then over here is your play button. If you want to play your game and then pause for like, you know, stopping it. And one thing to note is any change you make in play mode will not carry over when you stop. So let's say I like added a bunch of assets while I was playing the game. If as soon as I stop the simulation, they're gone. It undoes everything that you did during play mode. Okay, so let's add our first asset. So well, first let's make folders for our assets. So what you're gonna do is right click, create folder. Now I'm gonna call this folder art. As I said, I am not good at typing. Okay. Then I wanna make a folder for scripts. And then because this is a small project, I'm gonna put all my prefabs in one folder, which I'll explain what that is later. So I'm gonna make another folder called prefabs. All right, so now let's open up the art folder. Um, and then right click, and you're gonna go to import new asset. So this is now, if you have downloaded those assets, navigate to them. I think mine are in documents actually. And if you wanna import both of them right now, you can. I'm just gonna start with importing Trumbus. Any questions so far? Cool, okay, so now I have Trumpus. Who here knows well, who Trumpus is? For those of you who don't know who the Trumpus is, he is essentially the IMGD mascot. He um, is a symbol of good luck and you'll usually found, find him drawn on various whiteboards around campus. He has a Wikipedia page or a fan wiki page. I think it's trumpus.wpi.edu. Um, and he's pretty cool. Um, Trumbus also can use any pronouns. It's just Trumbus. Um, but yeah, um, so I decided to make this game about Trumbus because he's a pretty cool guy. So now I have my art asset. One thing to note, depending on your Unity version, the texture type might not be Sprite 2D and UI. It might be set to default. You'll notice that if it is, or no, maybe it's not default. It's like one of the settings might just be none. On one of the Unity versions, it will put it into a setting where you can't drag it into the scene. So if you have a problem where you can't drag your asset into the scene, it's probably because it needs to be Sprite 2D and UI. This version doesn't have that issue. Now, one thing I do, because I know that a lot of my assets are going to have animations, is I always, no matter what, put my sprite mode into multiple. So you don't have to when it's a single sprite like this, but I find it a good practice to do because if you need to convert something to multiple later, um, you'll lose the asset reference everywhere. So it's better off just like having it multiple first, and then, you know, you can rename it if you need to like re-slice it and it doesn't mess things up as much. Um, so then I go multiple. For this art asset and this tutorial, I'm not gonna change any of these other settings. One thing to note is that if you're doing pixel art, you're probably going to want to use um, point no filter and compression none. And another thing to note is that you can save your presets here by like select preset and then you can create a new preset and apply that to pre like new art assets. But this is all I'm going to do for this one. So now I'm going to move the zoom controls out of the way and I'm going to click apply. So now that I, since I put this in multiple, I need to slice this right. So I'm going to go to sprite editor, slice, and then for this one, I can just do automatic center all those settings, slice, apply and basically now it like figured out the sizing of the sprite and put a box around it if it ever does it wrong you can adjust the box sometimes you have a sprite that has like two pieces to it and there's a bit of gray space in between so we'll slice it as two different things so you can like delete one of those boxes and just resuck it size it to fit your asset and then you can x out here and then sometimes this will come up you just press save and now you have your first sprite ready so the next step is to put it in your scene. So you literally just drag it right into the scene. And now 
there's multiple ways to do everything in Unity, by the way. Like you, I could go here and do create and stuff like that. Um, but it's easiest just to drag your asset into the stream. And then I'm going to rename this player. This is our player character. Um, so this is where the inspector becomes important. So this is going to be the top part. It's just the name of the game object, which you see over here. Um, and then tag, since this is the player, I'm going to tag this as the player. Layer for this game default is fine. The idea here is like, if you want two things not to interact with each other, you can put them on different layers and change settings so they don't hit each other. But that's not going to come up here. And then I have my sprite renderer. This basically chooses what sprite comes up. So I could change Trumbus to like anything. But obviously, I want Trumbus to be Trumbus. So I'm just going to undo that. Uh, you can change color, all that kind of stuff. So. I have a sprite, but obviously I want to make the sprite interactable, right? Like I want to be able to make him move around. So one thing to do that is you need a rigid body. So since this is a 2D game, get a rigid body that's 2D. And this is basically adds physics to the game object. So if I were to press play, from this is gonna fall because there is no floor and there's just gravity applied. So Trumpus will just kind of keep going down infinitely. That I don't want. So just go to gravity scale, set it to zero. Now, if you press play, Trumpus stays still. The other thing you're going to want is a box collider. So there's three types of colliders for 2D. There's um, box collider, and then circle collider 2D, and then polygon collider 2D. Um, with Trumbus, I'm just going to do a box collider. You could do a polygon collider that basically allows you to like make a very custom shape, but box collider is fine. And if you add the box collider after you have the sprite in, it will automatically size it to the sprite. If you don't do this, you'll notice that your box collider is very tiny. To fix this, after you put a sprite in, you can just do reset, and it will fit it to the sprite. So now that I have a box collider, that basically means that this object detects collisions, and the bounds of those collisions are where those green lines are. So the rigid body and the box collider work together and look at contacts, for example, and all that kind of stuff. And this is basically your core of your physics. Um, any questions? Cool. All right. So now we want to actually be able to move Drumbus. So we're going to add a script. So you can go to create component. And when you want to make a script, you can just write the name of what you want the script to be called. So I'm going to call this like player control. I'm going to abbreviate to right? And then you can do new script, create and add. The one issue with doing this is it won't automatically put it in your scripts folder. Um, so if you do make it off of the game object, you have to go back and just drag it into your scripts folder. Now to edit the script, you can just double click here and it will launch Visual Studio or whatever like ID you have attached and it will bring up the default script. So here it has already made player control for me. And this is the basic layout of a Unity script. So you have mono behavior, which is basically like all of the actions for Unity and whatnot. And Unity scripts have start and update. So start is basically called here before the first frame. There's also a wake, which is called before that, um, which is like when things load. Um, and then update, as it says, it's called every frame. So that's basically like every tick in the engine, all of these, everything in update is called. So because we want to move our character, we want that movement to happen every frame. So we're going to use update. You can delete start. Actually, we might use start later. Don't delete start. I forgot about that. OK, so update. So basically, we want it so that when you press keys, right, Trumbus moves. Um, actually, I can show you what the goal is. The goal is this here. So if you look here, 
Let's hold on. Oh, wait, it is working. I just. Oh, I'm in the wrong thing. My bad. Okay, I don't have it up. Never mind. I'm not going to waste your guys' time opening up the finished version of this. But basically, the idea is that you press keys and Trumpus will walk around. So, in order to do that, you need to access the input system. So, the first thing I like doing for stuff like this is because update calls every frame, I want the computer to say the least amount of time in update to reduce any sort of like lag. So the first thing I'm going to do is just check to see if any key is being pressed. So do if, and then here you can do input dot any key. So now this is a bool that will return if any key on your keyboard is being pressed. Then um, now that you know, like, okay, key is being pressed. Right now, the only keys that would be being used in this game is horizontal and vertical. But you want to double check because you want people to be moving around if they're pressing like the Y key. So now you're going to do if, and then with input, you can actually do get access. And this is a cool thing because instead of having to bind like up to W and up arrow, basically, if you do get access or um, did I spell that right? Um, so if you get access horizontal, it will return any input on the W or the up arrow and the S and the down arrow. Um, so this does not equal zero. It's going to be a float value based on like what is being pressed. Um, and if I recall correctly, this would work also with controllers, right? Because it returns a flow, the accesses. Yeah, so if you were adapting this for controller, that's why it's a flow value. You would have like, you can scale it. Um, and then you know, I want to do the same thing for vertical. It's sort of like that or no? Did I spell that right? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, and then this you need to say does not equal zero. Um, oh, I forgot the or. Cool. So if this is true, then now we're going to want to move the player. So the way you move the player is by accessing the rigid body. And this is the most important thing to know about programming in Unity. Anytime you need to do pretty much anything, you're going to need to get component. So get component basically looks for the component, which is all of these things here that you add. And I'm going to look for the rigid body component. So go back here, get component, rigid body, and make sure to do rigid body 2D, because this is a 2D object, right? And then dot velocity. Um, one other thing to note is that if you're looking for like a specific game object component, you could do like here the default game object is what this is attached to. So I could write game object dot sorry, it's lowercase g. Uh okay, so game object dot get component. And that's like this game object. And the same way, like if I import, like I access a different game object in the scene, I can do dot get component on that. So, and then you're going to want to set the velocity to your input. So here you have to do, if you look here, it says that it is a vector, a rigid body 2D, right? And it's a vector 2. So vector 2 in Unity is just, a data structure that scores two floats. And usually you can access it by like, this is the X float and the Y float. So like, you know, X and Y values. So here we're gonna do new vector two. And then you're basically just wanna take your inputs. You can also store these in a variable if you prefer. And then now that we'll get, your stuff. And then I like to just do control B to build stuff. Um, I think it makes it load faster. I'm not sure if that's actually true.
And now if I press play, and I click in, we have movement. This is very slow. You could scale it up by just multiplying stuff to your values, but basic movement control, and this works from pressing W or the arrow keys. Um, oh, one thing I did forget to notice is that Trumbus just keeps moving. I forgot to reset the value of the velocity to zero. So let's go back. And if there isn't any keys being pressed, you're gonna to wanna to just put your velocity to zero. So you can just grab this. All right, it's actually a vector too. So now it will set that to zero. Oh, you want this in an else too. Forgot about that. So if a key is being pressed, you get to move. Otherwise, just set it back to zero. This is a very basic control system. There are like other ways to do it. This is just for the purpose of this tutorial. I'm doing a very basic setup. Um, but now, if I click into game, oh, here we go. From just moves and then stops. Okay. Now you'll notice that this is pretty boring. And it doesn't really look like Trumbus is walking, it looks like Trumbus is floating. So let's add a walk cycle. So go into your art folder and now import that other asset, uh, Trumbus walk, walk cycle. Which for me is in documents. And cool. So now, Oh, I think exactly okay. So now you'll notice that the white, this walk cycle is a sprite sheet. Um, a lot of artists will give you sprite sheets. There's multiple ways to make animation. My preferred way is just from a sprite sheet where each of the instances of Trumpus is just a frame in the animation. It's a really bad animation because I've just made it for this tutorial, but it's an animation nonetheless. So make sure your texture type is sprite 2D UI, sprite mode, multiple, um, all of that. Then you press apply, sprite editor. And now this is where we make the frames of the animation. Thank you. Okay, so the way I made this animation is that each frame is equally spaced out. Because if you notice when he's stepping out, it's a bit larger. So if I were to slice automatically, the frames would be different sizes. But because the pivot is the center, it would look like he's jumping around and like jiggling, which we don't want. So instead, I'm going to go by cell count and do three columns and slice it like that. And now it's perfect frames. Press apply. And then we can just exit out. And now, the way I like to make animations is I just drag it right in. And then it prompts you to save it as an animation. So I'm going to call this from this walk cycle and right save. Now, if I press play, you'll notice that the animation will play on here. But I have to actually add the animation to my character. So I'm going to delete this. And the way you do this is you're going to add an animator. So here, animator. And then it's going to look for a controller. Just click into here, and it should pop up this controller. So now if I play, the animation is always playing, right? The issue now becomes he looks like he's walking when he's not even walking, right? So we're going to deal with that in a second. First, I just want to talk about prefabs, because we've gotten pretty far into making the player, right? Um, prefabs are very good for multiple reasons. Basically, prefabs is a way of like bundling up your object into, like, what's a better way to explain it? Like, like a template. Yeah, like a template. So 
The nice thing about prefabs is if you're using version control, it's a text file, so it saves a lot better with different versions and stuff like that, where you'll find that changes in the scenes or like specific game objects that are not a prefab tend to get a bit wonky across version control. So the other advantage of prefabs is because it's a template, you can make duplicates of like the thing and they all have the same settings. Even though the player you're not duplicating, only having one player, it's still worth making the player a prefab for the purpose of like, if I were to put this on version control, it makes it a lot safer. So the way you make a prefab, there's two ways. I'm gonna go over the second one later, but the first way is just drag the object. Wait, let me go into the prefabs folder. Into your project view, your project thing. I didn't really go over this earlier, but here your tabs are different things that are like important to working in Unity. This is like your file system. I think I have two project tabs because on a different thing, I just opened up two because sometimes I like to be able to access two different spots. Console, we will all of your errors and warnings pop up, like whatever that is. Um, and you can also filter. So if I click on this, I can like toggle whether or not I can see warnings. Uh, profiler is about like how much you, CPU usage and whatnot, and yeah. So now I have a prefab. So if you double click, it opens up the prefab view. So now what happens is any change I make here, like updates, this is the base prefab, we'll update across the board. So for example, if I didn't do it in the base prefab view, if I were here, I made another version of player and I were like to go like this, right? Nothing happens to this guy. But if I want that change to happen, I can go to overrides, apply all, and now that applies to all of the instances of it. Now that looks funny, so I'm gonna undo it and delete it. Okay, so let's go back to the animation. So if you click here, right, you have the animation stuff. Basically, you just need to be clicked on the game object, the animator you want to edit. And then, sorry, the zoom is in my way. You can click on your animator tab. Now here you have a basic animator setup. So the way the animator works is it's a node-based thing and you can add parameters that trigger conditions that look through transitions to go through your different states. So basically here it's on entry, just no matter what, it goes to this walk cycle animation. Now we don't want that. We want to start our entry with an idle animation. So to make an idle animation, we can go to the first version of Trumbus. Just right click on that first thing if you open it up, create uh, animation, and then you can just call this like idle. And now you have a one frame idle animation. So right now, entry goes to the walking animation. So what I want to do is I want to create a state empty. So now this allows me to add a new animation state, rename it to idle. Then for motion, I basically put in my new, so in second zoom is in the way, uh, my new animation here. And I want this to go on entry so you can right click it and set as default state. So now see how that's orange? So now you have to figure out how to get it to move to this one. So first you need parameters. This, because you want in your code, like when I'm pressing this button, trigger the walk cycle, right? So there's different ways to do this. For the sake of time, uh, since we lost a lot of time to set up, I'm just going to go over triggers. This is the simplest way. So a trigger basically is, once you turn it on, it turns right off. It, like it's a one blink kind of thing. So I'm gonna make a trigger for walk and I'm gonna make a trigger for idle. And in my code, I'm basically gonna call the trigger and it's just gonna like light up that radio button here. And then something will happen depending on you know your transitions. So I wanna go from any state, this basically means from anywhere in the animation cycle, make transition and I want to transition to the walk cycle. So you click on that arrow to add conditions. So the conditions are basically like, when this condition is met, do this transition. So what you want basically is just you add it, it automatically just do walk. So from any state, if the walk trigger is triggered, it will move to the walk cycle animation. And then you just do the same thing for idle. So here you're just going to want to change walk to idle. Uh, any questions? I did go through that a little fast. Cool. All right, so now the issue is like, 
nothing's going to happen right now because there's nothing calling these triggers. So we need to go back to our code and do that. So if you go back here, another thing I'm going to show you is like here I did like get component rigid body here and like had to type it out each time. Another thing you can do instead is set it up at the start. So like as one of your private variables, you can just do like private uh, animator. Private animator, animator. And now you have a reference to animator, but it's not going to be set yet. It's really tempting to just try to set it right here, but you actually have to set it in start because it doesn't work because the game hasn't like loaded yet. So it can't like find the references. So here you can just do animator equals get component animator. And now you have a variable that references the animator on this game object. So what you want to do here is if you're going to move, you want to do animator dot. And then here you're going to do set trigger. And then it's looking for either a string or an int. So in our case, we named our parameters right by strings. So you just want it to match. I did the rule uppercase w walk. So now when this line of code executes, it just triggers the walk. Uh, and then you're just going to want to do the same thing, but for idle in the stock. Any questions? Yes. This is Visual Studio. Um, there's two Visual Studios. There's Visual Studio Code and this one, I think this one is Visual Studio, not code. Basically, there's a purple and a blue one. Um, I personally prefer the UI of this one, the purple one, uh, and the way it integrates into Unity better. It's also Unity usually will default install with, but you can use the blue one. Um, I've heard that it like is a little faster, but I just hate the interface on it, so I don't use it. Also, it doesn't have certain important things enabled by default. Yeah, that too, and like it did import things. And the good thing about like using the, what Unity sets up is it automatically has access to all the libraries and all that. So like anytime I type, it looks through like Unity stuff. Um, so now I already built that, I think. But sorry, that's the wrong game. And then one thing that you can do also that's cool is you can keep the animator tab open while you're playing the game. So you can see what state things are in. So now if I were to start playing, you can see that it's hit triggering that. So you'll notice that it does take a second to stop. Um, that's because of like, the settings here, and you usually have to toggle with that and like get that to work. But for the purposes of this tutorial, we're just going to leave it as is. Um, another thing to note is that right now it's just constantly triggering like which one of her one I said, right? Um, if you did bulls, for example, like or any other thing where like it's like supposed to just stay for a while. Um, when like in see how the arrow arrows constantly firing in this case is the way I set it up. If you have something where the arrow only fires once, but you want the animation to keep looping, just make sure when you click on the animation that loop time is on. If you don't want it to keep looping and you want it to exit after like go to another animation, you can just turn off loop time and it will just go to the next thing in the flowchart. Okay, so now we have a basic animation set up. Um. The next thing we're going to do is make something to interact with. So I'm going to go back into scene view and into prefabs and let's make a collectible item. So I'm going to right click here and I want to make this as a prefab, right? Because we want a lot of collectible items. I'm going to create and then I am going to go to prefab and I'm just going to call this item. So I'm going to open it up and add the basic component. So first thing you're going to want is a sprite renderer. Uh, I just choose something random. I don't know. Can look through. There's some funny looking things here. Choose what is appealing to you. Um, doesn't really matter. Then I'm gonna add a box collider. 
Now, with the box collector 2D, this is where things become a little different. So I want the player to collect this. So I want the player to be able to pass through it and like pick, like collect it, it's just gonna disappear. So in order for that to happen, I need to make it a trigger. Because if you look here, right, it has a collider. So if I were to put it in front of the player, the player is going to just kind of not be able to interact, right? Like it's gonna hit it and just move around. Um, which is going to not look as good as if it's collecting it by just passing through it. So you turn on is trigger, and if something is a trigger, that means that the player, like the rigid body is basically passed through a hole. It still detects collisions, it just means that things pass through it. If you wanted things to pass through and not detect collisions, that's where like you would look at layering and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, now we want to add a behavior to this um, object to just disappear when the player collects it. So I'm going to go to scripts. Another way to make a script is just go into your script folders, create C sharp script, and then just give it a name like collect me. If I open that up, it will have the same setup. For this, we don't need start or update, so I can just delete them. And what instead we want to do is on trigger enter to be. So this is a function that will call as soon as something else collides with that trigger we put, like that box collider. Um, if you're doing just regular box colliders and they're not triggers, you're going to want to, instead of using on trigger, you're going to do on collision enter. Um, there's different versions. There's like collision exit. It depends on what you want to do. The other thing to note is this collision is like what collided with it. So you can use that in theory to like access the other thing and edit it. But here, when we get like collided with, all we want to do is just destroy the object. So just do capital D destroy. And then you can just do game object, which refers to the game object this script is attached to. So now I go here. Oh, I forgot one thing, my bad. We need a rigid body on the um, item. So let's open it. And oh, also, I didn't add the scripts. That would also be important. So the bad thing about making scripts directly in the scripts folder is that you have to remember to put them onto the object. So you can just do like create new component, collect me. And then now it has it. Also, I'm going to add a rigid body to enable physics and then just set the gravity scale to zero so it doesn't fall. Although if you wanted to like play around with this game, like. You could put a bunch of them at the top and then like let them fall around and stuff and have fun with that. Um, and then it just disappears. And you'll notice that it's no longer in my hierarchy. If I go out, it's no longer in my hierarchy. It's gone. Okay, so now we have basic game gameplay. Now you probably want like a UI, right? To kind of keep track of what's going on. So I'm gonna go over how to make the UI. So you right click here. UI, and then you can just directly make a canvas, but also if you just go to the type of thing you want. So in this case, I want something to keep track of how many things I've collected. So I'm going to do um, text. It will automatically make a canvas. So the canvas, oh, you also may need to import this. So, so um, canvas is basically like the UI layer of the scene. Um, so all of your UI stuff will go on the canvas, but also the way the canvas works is it's attached to like the camera essentially. So it will move like if the camera's moving, the canvas moves with it. So that's how like in a lot of games, you notice like your score indicator doesn't just stay like next to a tree, it moves with the player, right? So by default, the canvas kind of is wacky, right? Because it's like all the way over here where my player is all the way over here, uh, the way I did that is if you click on something, then you hover over here and press F, it will zoom in on it. And that's like, find. That's a useful shortcut to know. Um, so now, a few settings I want to change on the canvas. First, instead of screen space overlay, I want screen space camera. Then I want to choose scene main camera. Now see how it snaps to where the character is? It's a lot easier to just design your UI if it's already overlaying where your camera is. Um, another thing I recommend doing is instead of constant pixel size, 
scale with screen size. The reason for this is if you do constant pixels, pixel size on like your screen, it might look good, but if someone opens it up on a much larger screen, it's going to stay the same size. So you'll have like tiny itty bitty UI and they're going to be like, what is this? It looks hard for Um, And then that's it for just setting up the canvas. With the text, this is my text mesh pro. I want this to be in the top corner. So if you press shift alt, you can snap it like that into the top corner. And then I want this to just say like score zero. So now I just need to add a script to um, change the score. So we're going to call this uh, display score. Cool. Uh, sometimes Unity won't open up your scripts by default. It's fine. You can just go to the wrong folder. Go to assets and just find it. Actually, I can move it into scripts. Okay. So here we don't need the start update again. Instead, let's make a function that when called just updates the score. So the way you do this is you want a public function so that other things can call it. And you're going to do public void update score. Now, if you were to try to get the component of the text mesh, it won't pop up because you need to import it. So like if I try to do like text mesh, it has text mesh, but this is not the right one. So what you have to do is do using TM Pro. If you forget this, but you remember what the thing is called, it will just prompt you on like what it's called. But uh, it's going to be text mesh pro UGI. So if it's a UI thing, you want to use UGI. If it's not a UI text mesh, then you do the other one. Dot text, and then now I can change the text. So one thing I'm going to want is a counter and a string that just is like the label. So string label equals score. Right, and then in score equals zero. And then you want us to set the text to label plus score. And the other thing you want to do is when this is updated, you first want to increase score because something has been collected. So you can just do score plus plus, which is like a shorthand version of saying score plus one. And now when this function runs, it will update the score by one. But now you actually need the, to get this to be called, right? So what you're going to want to do is on the player controls, you're going to want this. You have two options here. You could put this on every single instance of the item. And every time the item determines that it's been collected, it updates the score. The issue with this is that you have to, every time you add an item into the scene, you have to now set like what the score object is or use find, which is not great. Um, so it's better off to just put it on the player because the player is also in that interaction when you need this to be updated. And then all you can do is just check to make sure that it's an item by just looking for that like collect me script and you know that something that needs to be updated. So when you do that is basically just um, you do another on I'm in the wrong another on trigger. And then this is what I was talking about earlier with like accessing the collision. You can do if collision dot, um, I think you can just do directly get component, or do you need to do game object dot get component? Collision or collider? It's collision. I need collider. Hmm? I need collider. What? I need collider to get the component. Like the collision is a collider to do, yeah. But like, uh, okay, it's harder. Yeah, yeah. Just get harder. yeah, so get component, and then I'm going to look for collect me, which will pop up here because it's one of my scripts. And remember to put parentheses after this. So this is like the type you're looking for, and that's why it goes in those brackets, the C sharp thing. Um, so if this, this will return like true essentially if that thing exists. So that means that this was something that needs to be collected. You can then do, um, you can now call the display score. So you first want to get that display score to the player. So you can add a reference to it that you've set it later because 
you basically like want to be passing and connecting these objects together. So if I do a serialized field, um, which will allow it this to pop up in the inspector, and I'll show you what that means in a second. Private. Um, private, and then we can just call this like the display score script. You can just call this like score script. And now I don't need to set this because essentially what happens is if I go here, oh, wrong one again. If I go here and I go to the player, um, and I go to that script that we made earlier, see how there's a a little um, spot here. Now you can go here and put in the object that you want it to reference, which is easier than like, there's an option where you can find things, but this is less processing power, it's much simpler. Um, and then now that we have that reference set up, you can just do score script dot update score, because that is a public method and it will update the score. So if I build this, Play. Score goes to one. Okay, we are running out of time, so I'm going to quickly just explain how to add a quit button and how to build. We probably won't have time to build, but just to kind of explain that. So, usually I like to make a script called Game Manager that just kind of handles all of like the overall game functions. So a new script game manager, right? And this by default, by the way, will um if I probably spelled it wrong, but sometimes it'll turn into like a gear icon. That's normal. But yeah, so if I go to game manager, basically I can just do um because you spelled it wrong. Yeah, I know. Um I can make a function called quit. So just like public void quit. Sorry, that auto fills that. Um, and then you just do application dot quit. And then that will quit your game. So this will not work in the editor, right? Because you're like not actually quitting game. So you won't know. It won't like you don't have any indication. So what I recommend doing is just a print. So with Unity, you can do print and just print out whatever you want. Or you can do um, debug dot log. Right, and then it will also put that out. So I have this thing and I just need to attach it to a button to make a, create, a quick button. So I'm just gonna go back here. Go to the canvas, create a button, so UI um, button, and then now I have this button. I'm going to probably want to put it, so shift alt into the corner over there. If you want to change the text, you just click into the hierarchy and just change it to quit. And then a button has a thing here where it says on click. You can add a thing, so I want to basically put that script somewhere in game manager. So I like to add it to the camera just because that's like something that's always there. Um, and then I can go back to button, go here, choose the camera. And now I can access any of its functions. So like another thing you could do is like go to its transform and like change things or like game object, you could like set things inactive, right? But here we want to quit. So I just go to this script, it accesses the quit function and now Power play. The console, I press quit, my output comes out. Um, another thing to know about the console is sometimes when you have errors, it will hyperlink you to like the line that it is, which is useful, or like highlight this, which is also useful. Um, but there aren't any errors, so that's not gonna happen right now. Um, but we have like a minute left, so I'm just gonna quickly explain how building works. So for building, basically, you would go to build settings. If you have multiple scenes, you do add open scenes. So here, like I deleted that other scene, so I need to re-add this one. 
Um, I'm doing Windows, so I leave all of this. And then the first time I like to do this because I want to make a folder. So like, oh, shoot, Windows in the way. For like my build, so I just usually call it build. And then I select that folder and then it will build to that folder. Um, what that basically is going to look like, because I don't want to make you wait for that. Go to here. Okay, go to like one of these, right? This is the last build I did for this game. Um, actually, this is going to be confusing because it has Mac on it. Uh, let me go to a different earlier build here. It basically will give you all of these files. If you want to um, export this, like share it, basically what you do, at least for Windows, is, uh, oh, here it came up. You just zip all of these, except for you don't really need this one, doesn't really matter, but you need to zip all of them in order to like the other ones to send it off. With Mac, it's just like two files. Um, so it's like not as big of a deal, but then you can double click here and it will run the exe. The main thing is like, you can't just send some of the exe, they need all the other folders. And now I have my game and look, it works. You can press quit and the game ends. Uh, that is all I have time for. If you have any questions about anything Unity related, please let me know. I will put a more in-depth slides out soon. Uh, yeah.